Thanks for the introduction. Um, yeah, so I mean, that's, I guess, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, this is joint work with a fairly large number of people at Google. Um, there is a small team I work with to actually work on these APIs and improve them and do some of the refactorings to adjust existing code to them. Uh, and then there is actually a much larger group of people in various teams we've worked with, teams like Gmail and Google Plus, to actually apply these at large scale. Uh, and I want to thank all these people for being willing to actually try this out and then uh, showing that it can be done and, and making it successful. And then I'd also like to thank the uh, Invited Talks Committee for, uh, for inviting me to speak here. So thanks for that. Okay, so as um, practitioners and I guess also theorists in the field of software security, I think we also share the sense that there are certain classes of bugs that just will not go away. Um, you know, uh, if, we, if we look at uh, some of these common classes, I'm going to be talking about injection bugs here today, and in particular SQL injection and cross-site scripting. Uh, they always feature at the very top of the top 10 or top 25 lists um, and, and have been doing so for, for many years, basically ever since they sort of came into existence. And they're really not, uh, things aren't getting any better. Um, incidentally, also, I'm quite happy that this is almost an album cover title here. So I'm in light of the last night's rum session. <laughs> <laughs> I should have thrown that in here. You know, the bare naked ladies are, you know, imagine that. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, um, so why is this? Uh, why are there so many bugs? Um, there are some reasons that I uh, can think of. Uh, one is that we essentially rely on developers, or the, the primary reason is we, we put the burden on developers to avoid these bugs, right? We're asking them to write code uh, on top of APIs that are inherently prone to the in introduction of these bugs, uh, and then we try to ec ed educate the developers and uh, teach them how to work around these sharp edges in those APIs, so to speak. And that clearly doesn't seem to work. Uh, some of the reasons I can think of for that are that there's just a uh, typically very large number of opportunities in a large-scale application to introduce these bugs. So if you look at XSS, you'll literally find thousands or at least hundreds in a large-scale application of code sites that could result in an XSS if there is a mistake uh, where, you know, uh, strings are being concatenated. So you have lots of opportunities uh, to make these mistakes, and people are human, so in some of those cases they will actually make the mistake and introduce a bug. Uh, mm -hmm. There is maybe also the aspect that in a lot of these cases, the um, primary focus of the developer has nothing whatever to do with security, right? They're uh, focused on rendering some UI in a browser or selecting tables from, uh, se selecting some rows from a database table. Uh, and that's not really a security-related activity, so they may actually be less inclined to think about that. I'm kind of interested in talking to, uh, so this is sort of a security and usability aspect, so I'm, I'm actually kind of interested in chatting about that later. Um, because, I mean, this is just my intuition. I'm not really sure if this is really the case. Um, sometimes, also, it's just that these issues are quite subtle. Uh, a priori, or fundamentally, XSS and SQL injection aren't really difficult to understand. I think if we give developer training, most of our developers actually get it, right? They, they, they know what the problem is. But sometimes there are some edge cases. For instance, in XSS, there, uh, there are some scenarios where uh, the injection involves multiple embedded sublanguages. You might have a JavaScript string literal inside a JavaScript expression inside a uh, um, event handler attribute inside HTML, and then what you need to do uh, to escape that correctly isn't actually all that uh, obvious, and, and so you may have some mistakes from that angle as well. So this really doesn't work, right? So uh, we have lots of opportunities for bugs. We'll end up with bugs in the code base, and this is pretty much, I think, all our, expert, uh, our, our experience. So what we do then is we try to find these bugs before we ship the product. Um, we use various um, dynamic and, and uh, static techniques. We use ma manual testing, automated testing, static analysis, human code reviews. And we'll find some of these bugs, but we pretty much never will find all of them. Right? Uh, these, these methods, they're all inherently incomplete, and we'll miss bugs, and then we'll ship bugs to production, and then we may ha might have a bug bounty program, which hopefully will report them to us responsibility. But we've basically failed at that point, right? We've shipped the bug, and it's too late. Um, I think one reason these methods for finding bugs are uh, so incomplete is that, in particular, with respect to these injection bugs, very often the data flows involved are really, really complicated and, and long, essentially, right? You have data that makes it through multiple systems across RPCs into persistent storage and then back out, and then somewhere along that path, uh, there is a lack of escaping or sanitization, and uh, then you have an injection bug. And that's really difficult to reason about, uh, both for humans and for automated systems. And so I think that's one of the reasons we actually have such a hard time finding these bugs uh, after the fact. And then, you know, in result, we kind of get low confidence in our security assessment, right? As a security engineer, I'm being asked to assess an application for, 
uh, XSS or particular classes of bugs, SQL injection, other classes of bugs, and uh, I kind of, I go look, I use some tools, uh, I find some of them, but really, it'll be a stretch to say I'm confident this large application, you know, hundreds of thousands of lines of code is free of that bug. I simply can't make that statement. You know, I, I can say I've looked for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or whatever, uh, but, but there's always a possibility that there are more bugs. So what can we do about this? Essentially what this comes down to, again, is that we put the burden for avoiding these bugs on the developer, right? We have APIs that fundamentally allow code to be written that has vulnerabilities, uh, that, that introduces vulnerabilities, and we put the burden on the developer to work around that, essentially. Right? And so what I'm proposing is to instead actually blame the API. It's a bad API if it allows the developer to write code that has a bug, in particular if that bug is sort of largely orthogonal to what they were really trying to do, right? It's a, it's a subtle consideration that's easily missed. So now the question, of course, can we do this in practice, right? Um, I mean, it's easy to say, but, but uh, we basically have to actually come up with APIs that are both uh, still usable and expressive enough for the developer to write the code they're, uh, they're supposed to write and ideally not actually make it much more cumbersome for them and, uh, or, 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 or convoluted. And at the same time, also give us these properties. We want the API to be um, of a form or of a design that uh, makes it essentially impossible for the uh, developer to write code that has a particular class of bug. And so th that's an interesting question. So I'm, I'm going to talk about two specific classes of bugs that we've worked on where I think we actually succeeded in doing this. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is SQL injection. So SQL injection, as we all know, arises if there is a query being sent to a database where um, some part of the query is derived from an untrusted input uh, and then you know, an attacker can essentially inject uh, some additional query syntax that gets evaluated uh, and then uh, typically what happens is that they subvert the sort of implicit intended access control that's um, uh, embedded or in implicit in the query semantics. So in this case, this is a table of maybe albums if some, in some photo sh sharing application, and the intent is that the request should only ever select uh, rows that are actually owned, where the album is owned by the currently logged in user, but by doing the usual one equals one thing uh, or one equals one thing, the attacker can basically select all the rows, and so the injection takes place and subverts uh, intended access policy. What we traditionally tell developers to do to avoid this uh, there, there's sort of a couple of common patterns that we, we ask developers to do when we, or to, to stick to when we, when we do our developer education. The probably most common one is prepared statements. We tell people always use prepared statements, uh, which basically addresses the issue if it was consistently followed, because in a prepared statement scenario, the query gets parsed first, and then uh, instead of parameters, actual internal external inputs being just uh, concatenated into it, there are placeholders, and then the actual value of the parameter gets supplied separately, and so it cannot possibly influence the parsing of the query and the structure of the query, so there's, there's no potential for injection. Unfortunately, in practice, if this is just a guideline, people aren't going to follow it, right? They might forget, or they might just think, in my particular case, it's gonna be okay, and I don't have to worry about it. Uh, so we basically still end up with code that is um, not inherently safe. There's potential bugs, and sometimes there will be, snake, be mistakes. If we have potential bugs, we'll have some actual bugs. Uh, the other thing that sort of sometimes happens is that they stick to the guideline by the letter, and they say they always use prepared statements, but then they actually prepare a statement that already has been injected. Uh, I don't see this very often, but I have seen this, uh, believe it or not, so this is kind of uh, pretty funny. Uh, the other thing we recommend is structural query builders, uh, so um, uh, ORM layers like Hibernate and so on, they, they have um, uh, programmatic APIs for creating queries, so you create a select object and then you add where clauses and so on. Uh, and that's also inherently resistant to a SQL injection, but it's also relatively cumbersome in comparison to just concatenating strings, uh, and developers really don't like it very much, right? So it, it works, uh, but, but it's not, not exactly popular. So the question is, can we come up with an API that has the property that it's inherently resistant to injection, but it's also simple. It's based on essentially string concatenation of, of uh, query snippets. Um, so if we look at what we actually really need uh, from this API in terms of a, a guarantee is that the, uh, the query that ends up being executed uh, has no data flow dependency on external input because the injection arises from a data flow dependency on untrusted input. Um, and so if we can prevent that from happening, then there is no injection. And this in turn, if we sort of turn this condition around, we can get by having an API that ensures that the query is a concatenation of application controlled strings, so trusted strings, uh, string literals and uh, constants in the program, 
uh, if our query is only composed of uh, such values, then by definition, it cannot be subject to injection because it never has any possibility for untrusted data to influence the query, right, uh, in terms of data flow. So um, can we do this? Well, uh, here's an example. It's actually really trivial, right? We have a, a builder that basically just wraps a string, and we have an append method that um, basically allows the programmer to add a snippet to the query, and we document that you should only call this with compile time constant expressions. So you can call this with a string literal, or you can call this with you know, um, the concatenation of several string literals and things like that. And so then, uh, you know, by this contract uh, of the API, by this constraint, we straightforwardly get the, uh, the invariant that the resulting query is actually a concatenation of trusted strings of, of program constants. And if the only queries that end up being sent to the database are queries produced by this builder, they can no longer be injection. So this sounds simple. Unfortunately, developers don't always read documentation, right? So uh, in my experience, if we just put this out, it's, it's virtually guaranteed that within month, within months, within a few months, we'll have many, many uses that look like this, where somebody uh, basically didn't heed the, the contract. I mean, I, I have lots of anecdotes in that vein to share. It's, it's guaranteed, right? So what we did to prevent this, because we really wanted to get to a place where we just have to stop, where we can just stop looking for, ex, uh, for SQL injection bugs in our code base, is we actually uh, rigorously enforce that constraint that the API documents in its, in, its, in its contract. And what we did to do that is we added a very, very simple static checker to our compiler tool chain that simply enforces this. Uh, the checker is built on top of the error-prone framework, which is a framework for building static checks like this where you essentially uh, express predicates on the type decorated uh, abstract syntax tree in the Java compiler, and then uh, you can turn this into uh, essentially bug findings and errors. And this, this, this uh, checker is, um, is built into our standard tool chain, so it always runs every time you compile a Java program, it's there. And we've built a checker that essentially enforces this constraint on uh, method parameters. So now if you try to compile this, you actually get a compiler error, right? It won't compile. And so with that now in place, we really have a, a, a pretty solid guarantee that uh, you cannot write code uh, against this builder that results in a query string that is injectable because the, the builder basically enforces the invariant that it's always a concatenation of uh, string literals effectively. Uh, so what does this look like if we look at sort of code that would have been written ad hoc and then um, what does the equ equivalent code look like using this builder? Here's a little example. We have a piece of, uh, uh, a piece of code that, um, again, is part of some you know, photo sharing application. And here, the intent of that statement is to uh, select rows from the table of albums uh, that are shared with the current user. And then, optionally, we select a subset of rows that correspond to albums that have a certain rating. So these albums have a star rating from 1 to 5 or something like that. Uh, this is a very common pattern. Uh, where you basically have um, code that constructs queries dynamically where uh, certain clauses of the query only get used or only appended to the query if um, a particular corresponding parameter is present in the external request. Uh, so this is something that we need to accommodate and this is in in incidentally is the reason why we do actually allow control flow dependencies on the query uh, because that's a very common pattern and we have to accommodate it. So if you look at, and this is actually also, as you can see, uh, in, uh, subject to a, so this has a, has a SQL injection vulnerability, this code. So if we look at what this code would look like using our builder, it basically looks exactly the same. We're still concatenating the same snippets of uh, query strings, except instead of a plain string, we use a query builder. Instead of plus equals, you use dot append. But it's, it's essentially the same code, uh, except, of course, now the uh, dot append of this original uh, snippet here um, with, with the uh, injected, um, with, with the injection present, wouldn't compile anymore because it's not a compile time constant expression. Uh, so we'd get a compiler error, and we have to change this code to um, essentially comply with the best practice of always using bind parameters to supply all the parameters to the query. So essentially, what our builder actually does is enforce this best practice effectively, which is kind of what we want. The other thing we've done uh, with this builder, so the, the one I showed you is like the really, really straightforward, simple version that does, just has an append method, and that's the essence of it. Uh, in practice, to make it a little nicer to use, and in particular to make these kind of refactorings more practical, we've added some syntactic sugar to it. Uh, in particular, it has the facility to keep track of the bind parameters as part of that query builder itself, uh, which allows you to uh, 
um, move the code that attaches the actual value for a bind parameter right next to the code that uh, uses that bind param parameter in a query snippet. And this, this kind of makes the code actually a little bit nicer and more readable, in particular if you have subroutines involved that you call to make certain query snippets. And so it actually turns out the developers really like this, so we actually made their life easier in, on top of making it more secure. So how did this turn out in practice? We basically went and implemented builders like this for the uh, widely used uh, SQL backends within, uh, the, uh, uh, for the SQL backends that are widely used within Google, in particular uh, F1 and Spanner, which are two, I guess, planet scale, um, um, uh, semi transactional, uh, uh, semi relational transactional databases that we use, um, and uh, as well for Hibernate, uh, which is more used in smaller scale corporate applications. Uh, so these APIs they used to have when they were launched, they used to have the traditional method that consumes the query as a plain string and hence is subject to injection. And so we were getting really worried about having to deal with injections. Incidentally, before these, it really wasn't possible to use uh, SQL uh, at scale at Google because it just doesn't, like MySQL doesn't scale to that scale, so nobody was using it, essentially. Uh, everybody was using NoSQL databases, Bigtable, and so on. And so we didn't actually have to deal with a SQL injection as an issue very much. But now as these scalable databases became available, all of a sudden it was a great concern, and that's why we uh, introduced this builder. So this is also an example of a case where we actually got on top of a vulnerability class before it ever happened, which is really nice. Uh, so, and so, uh, so basically we went and implemented these builders and then uh, we went around the existing code of all the call sites into the methods that you know, took the, plain, the query as a plain string and we refactored them in a similar way to what I just showed you to use the, uh, the safe builder. This was a somewhat epic refactoring. I mean, it was a couple of person quarters effort from people in my team, but in the big scheme of things, it's actually not such a big deal. Uh, these types of large-scale refactorings happen all the time at Google. The, the people who curate the core APIs, such as Guava, which you might be familiar with, uh, when they find a better way of expressing a particular API, they do similar refactorings uh, to adjust existing usage to the new API and then get rid of the old API, and that's, um, it, it's very common and much, much larger scale than what we did here. So this might seem kind of a big deal, but it really wasn't, uh, relatively speaking. And then when we're done with that refactoring, we just removed the execute query uh, method that took a string altogether, and so it's gone, so you can't call it anymore. Now the only way to interact with that API is through the safe builder. Uh, in Hibernate, we couldn't actually do this because it's a third-party API, we can't just remove methods from it. And so what we did instead is add another um, custom error-prone checker that really just essentially constrains where call sites to these raw Hibernate uh, query methods can occur, and they're constrained to be within our wrapper API, so to speak, uh, which gives us essentially the same effect in a bit more roundabout way. And so with that, we're basically done worrying about SQL injection, right? You simply cannot write code against, these API, uh, against this API that is injectable because it will not allow you to add any non-constant string into the, uh, into the query. So it, it's simply not possible to write code that has injection. It won't compile, which is really nice. I mean, we're basically done worrying about this as a class of vulnerabilities. Well, sort of. Uh, there is one little uh, wrinkle. So there's always exceptions. Um, there, there is always going to be a few use cases that cannot be expressed in terms of this safe API. So one example would be a command line query tool that's used by database administrators to send arbitrary, query, arbitrary queries to the database. Uh, in that case, there's really, injection is not a concern because um, the principal who's running the tool is the same as the principal that's authenticated to the database and they have full authority to execute queries on whatever tables they have access to, right? Now, if we only had the API that is constrained to use, um, to, use um, to build queries from constant strings, this really wouldn't work, right? Because here the query comes from standard input. And so to accommodate this, we basically uh, introduced or kept a potentially unsafe, unconstrained API, which is really just the old API that consumes a string, uh, but to make sure that developers don't end up using it without thinking about it and without a strict need um, we, we uh, actually enforced uh, usage, uh, whitelisted usage of that API, and we're using, in our case, a mechanism uh, that's provided by our build system that allows you to configure packages in the build system to have limited visibility to other packages. So we basically enforce that um, only packages that we've reviewed and that have a good reason to use this backdoor API, so to speak, actually get to use it. Uh, and for anybody else, if they try to use it, it won't build because they're not on the build, build visibility list. Um, what's important is that this backdoor API, if you want to call it that way, 
is really rarely needed in practice. We only uh, needed it in like one or two percent of the call sites. And so doing the manual review, and in particular doing manual curation of new proposed uses of it is very, very feasible. I basically sort of you know, get like an email about this like every two weeks on average from you know, all of Google. So it's, it's very practical to do it this way. All right, so um, let's move on to preventing XSS, um, which is a bit more difficult problem. Um, XSS fundamentally, as I sort of mentioned in the beginning, is, is a much more complex uh, beast, and there's much more complexity in the different contexts in which injection can happen and what needs to be done to prevent the, uh, the injection vulnerability. Um, there's, there's lots of different variants of XSS. I think uh, two of the main reasons we see XSS are due to coding pattern, uh, to, due to a couple of coding patterns. One is uh, the sort of ad hoc generation of HTML markup. It's basically handwritten code that concatenates strings together to make uh, to make HTML markup. Uh, here's an example, and this is incidentally one that's a little bit more subtle. Uh, that was a real bug, I forget what application, but basically the, the gist of it here is that this variable category is, is externally controlled. It's potentially attacker controlled. And then the intent of the programmer was to render an anchor uh, tag with an onclick handler that when pressed calls a JavaScript method with the value of that string category as an argument. Uh, and then they basically wanted to fill that into the inner HTML of this particular element. Uh, and it looks like they actually knew about XSS because they, they used escaping methods. And in fact, they used the correct ones, right? They used the correct standard library methods to do the escaping. In particular, they used the right method to do the escaping for the string JavaScript string literal context. And then they used also the right method, the Google string HTML escape. Uh, these are methods in the closure library um, to do the escaping for HTML context. But there's still a bug, and I'm just curious, you know, can I get a show of hands who can see what the bug is? A couple of people. Here's a hint, this is the exploit vector. So the bug is that the order of escaping operations is reversed. They should have first uh, JavaScript string literal escaped and then HTML escaped on top of that. Right? So this is an example of a, a more subtle consideration. Uh, incidentally, I think this might also be a tricky uh, case to catch for a static analysis tool. I haven't tried it, but I'd be surprised if existing static analysis tools would be able to figure this out. It's, principle in po it's possible in principle, right? You have to basically keep track of the context within the HTML markup that's being created here, but it would be pretty challenging. Uh, so, you know, I mean, uh, basically what we tell people is to not do this, right? In this case, probably the better pattern would have been to use the DOM API to create this uh, corresponding DOM. Uh, or what we tell people to do is, is just use templates, HTML template uh, systems to create HTML markup. Uh, now here's an example of a little template. Uh, in this case, it renders a, a part of a profile page for a social network, uh, for instance, or a, a blogging application or something like that. Um, and uh, so we'll assume that this template system actually has a feature that's pretty widely available, which is automatic escaping. So there's a lot of template systems that can be configured or maybe even by default do this to uh, automatically HTML entity escape and code all the substitutions that go into the template system. Right? Uh, so let's assume this, this template actually does this. Uh, this is closure template syntax, just as an example. Um, and so what this does is this auto escaping will actually prevent XSS due to the substitution of the profile.name field because uh, this is regular sort of uh, body of an element context and so HTML escaping is sufficient to prevent uh, XSS. However, um, with the, um, I don't know if I can yeah, use this pointer here, with the blog URL field, it's a little bit different, right? Because this actually occurs in the context of an href attribute of an anchor tag and hence will be interpreted as a URL and if this is completely unconstrained from external input, which is reasonable, so this is the URL to their own blog that an, uh, a user may be allowed to put in here so they can link to their own blog from their profile page in our social network. Um, if this is not validated anywhere, then it might actually be set by an, a malicious user to JavaScript colon some expression. And then if another user sees this and clicks on it, uh, they get XSS, right? So what's missing here is basically um, a template directive, a filter, that uh, first sanitizes this value as a benign URL, like a well-formed HTTP or HTTPS URL, uh, and would reject JavaScript and other URLs, uh, and then HTML escapes it, right? So in this case, we have an XSS because the developer uh, forgot to introduce a context-specific sanitization 
Um, and that's possible even if the default HTML escaping is in place. The other bit that's tricky about this template, of the, about this particular example, is that we have a block here where the developer's intent is actually to render HTML markup without escaping. So the use case here is that we allow our end users to enter a little blurb about themselves and we give them an HTML editor and so they can add, they can use basically fonts and uh, boldface and that kind of stuff, you know, inline pictures of Nyan cats or whatever they want. Um, but it, the intent is that it's inert HTML that will not cause script execution and therefore is actually safe to render here. Um, and so uh, to do this, the developer used a directive dis to disable the automatic escaping for this particular substitution. Now, if we look at this in the bigger picture, um, and we consider that this application is now given to one of our security engineers uh, to do a code audit on. Um, so our security engineer gets this and gets this code, and uh, so this is a slice of the overall application. And so what you have to do is uh, basically uh, find all the syncs that are prone to cross-site scripting injection, such as inner HTML assignments in client-side code and server-side code that renders HTML responses and so on, and then backtrace the data flow into those syncs and figure out if there's appropriate escaping of everything that flows into it. Right? So in this case, you should notice that this renders a template and then assigns the result of rendering the template uh, to the inner HTML property here. Um, and then uh, the next step would be to, uh, would be to look at the template, and uh, there you would notice that uh, there is a no auto escape uh, directive on this about HTML, which then means that now the, the flow of the value into this field is relevant. Right? This, this is now required to be um, HTML that is inert and will not result in third party controlled script execution. So you shall go back and basically backwards trace the data flow. Uh, this comes from an RPC from a web app front end, and then uh, there's another RPC. Uh, from an application backend, which now reads this from a profile store. And so far, there hasn't been any kind of standardization along this flow. Uh, so now we're kind of in a bit of a trouble because we have to now find all the different applications that might be writing to this profile store. Might even be something owned by a different team. We have to validate and, and assert or uh, ascertain that uh, all the front ends, of which there might be different ones, right? There might be a web front end, there might be a mobile front end, there might even be a developer facing API, that they all do proper sanitization of the value that goes in there. And so we're pretty, pretty quickly, we're down like deep into the weeds. And this is just one inner HTML assignment, right? And there'll be in a large scale application, there'll be many of these. And so really doing a comprehensive res a review of this type of thing is, is very, very challenging and very time consuming and error prone. We might get some, ho uh, some help from static analysis tools. I'm personally not so optimistic. I, I, I've tried to use them, but in this type of scenario, I mean, we're, we're crossing three languages, two different RPC mechanisms, and the data flow goes through persistent storage. And this is just really, really hard for a static analysis system to reason about, right? And I've tried it, it really doesn't work. So this is, this is bad, right? So what do we do about this? Uh, so the first thing we did is we introduced what we call uh, strictly contextually auto-escaping template systems. Um, this is a mouthful, but what it comes down to is, is essentially um, an extension to context-sensitive auto-escaping, uh, which is something that we've developed over the years. Um, and there's, there's uh, one context where this was actually published uh, by my colleague Mike Samuel and Pratik Saxena of, I think, Berkeley at the time. Um, and essentially the idea is that the template system actually understands the HTML markup, and it infers the context within the rendered HTML of where each substitution takes place. Right, so it'll work out that, for instance, a substitution is taking place within the href attribute on an anchor element, and then it knows that this is going to be a URL, and hence it needs to be sanitized as a URL, and then HTML escaped in order to avoid XSS. And so this helps a lot uh, because it basically, by default, does the right thing. Right? The developer, if they don't add any escaping directives, this will pretty much guarantee uh, that everything is correctly escaped for the context that it appears in. Unfortunately, in practice, there are still a lot of bugs, even if we use contextually auto-escaping template systems, due to reasons like this about HTML um, example that I had, right? We have, uh, we have legitimate cases, and sometimes cases where the developer thinks it's legitimate, but they just sort of had the wrong reasoning about it, where they disable or modify the automatically inferred uh, template escaping, and then if they make a mistake in doing that, they'll introduce a cross-site scripting bug. So what we've done is we've essentially uh, strengthens uh, the, the um, constraints that the template system impo imposes, and we basically just said we have a strict mode that completely disallows the use of template modifi of escaping modifiers within the template system. Uh, 
So now you're no longer allowed to use no auto escape or add any manual escaping directives in the template. And uh, we've also made this recursive. So uh, a strict template can only call another strict template. And so with that taken together, we essentially sort of get the guarantee that a strict template gives rise to a function from template parameters to a string that's HTML markup that's guaranteed by construction to not result in XSS when rendered. Right? So we've essentially taken the templates out of the equation as far as a source for cross-site scripting vulnerabilities is concerned. Um, so if we look at this again in this example, well, the, if we make the template strict, um, basically it looks the same, except there, there are no uh, escaping directives, escaping filter modifiers allowed, those are inferred by the template engine and sort of implicitly inserted, right? And it, it does the right thing. It works out that uh, profile name just needs to be HTML escaped and uh, the blog URL, because it's a, it appears in a URL context, needs to be sanitized as a URL and then HTML escape because it's also in an attribute. And uh, so everything is, is, is safe. Now, unfortunately, We've now also broken the feature of rendering legitimate markup in this about HTML box, right? Because the template system has inferred that this should be HTML escaped, and we're not allowed to turn that off because it's a strict template. So what do we do about this? Uh, we essentially introduce types uh, that designate uh, data that is safe to use in a particular context. Implementation-wise, these are just really trivial wrappers for a string. The type is really just there to attach a uh, security contract effectively to the value. And we have types that correspond to all the contexts that are relevant in HTML. So we, for instance, have safe HTML as a type that um, basically promises that its value, if rendered, its string value, if rendered as HTML in an HTML context, will not cause a script execution or a malicious script execution, externally controlled script execution. Similar for safe URL, if you put it in, in a URL context and dereference it, uh, nothing bad will happen, and so on. Um, these, the idea of using these types actually goes back to some work we did in uh, Google Web Toolkit sort of around uh, 2009, I think. Um, we, we now have sort of generalized this and, and created instances or uh, implementations of these types that are um, in a general purpose library, but it's basically the same idea. Um, for a programmer to create instances of these types, uh, we have a couple of options. One is we have libraries of builders um, and producers for these types, for values of these types that themselves uh, uphold the type contract by construction. So they themselves expose an interface that is um, inherently safe with respect to guaranteeing the type contract. So we don't actually have to review any of the code that uses these builders. Uh, there are structural builders that sort of give you kind of a DOM API-like interface where you create, you know, a uh, an anchor element and then you add an href attribute to it and the implementation of the builder will ensure that things get uh, escaped and sanitized appropriately. Uh, you can also create instances of the safe HTML type by rendering a strip, strict template because the strict template system by construction supports that type contract and so uh, the result of rendering uh, a strict template essentially satisfies the safe HTML contract and we can give you the result as that type. The other thing we have are these unchecked conversions, uh, which are basically unsafe, potentially unsafe casts from string to those types, if you will. Um, those are there in this model to accommodate these exceptional use cases, right? So we might have, for instance, a situation where somebody wants to render a URL that is um, a URL for an Android intent, and that's like a really weird format, so we don't have support for sanitizing it in the standard template system implementation. And so in that case, they can use a custom builder for this type of URL, for Android intent URLs, and then that builder will basically wrap the result of um, what it does as that type. All uses of these unchecked conversions, of course, need to be security reviewed because they're basically security critical. The fan in to the unchecked conversion has to satisfy the type contract that we require. And to make sure that that happens, we again use this build visibility mechanism to ensure that only people who've talked to us and who've gotten a review can actually use them. Right? So this helps us to kind of keep a lid on inappropriate use of, of those unchecked conversions. Uh, the other thing that we do is to just disallow the use of injection-prone syncs directly in application code. So we basically ban the use of inner HTML assignments in application-level JavaScript code. You're only allowed to use it in whitelisted places such as inside the runtime for the template system and inside wrappers that take a safe HTML type, for instance, and unwrap it and then assign it to HTML. So we basically cleaned up, uh, we clean up all the application level code from uh, these potentially injection prone sinks. 
And the, again, the enforcement for that is, is a very simple static check, which is basically whitelisting call sites, and that's, that's a trivial thing to implement. So what does this look like if we put it all together? Um, now this slice of the application, uh, you'll see that in the JavaScript code down here, where we used to have an inner HTML assignment, we now just directly call into the runtime of the template system to render a strict template. And rendering strict templates is always safe, so this is something our uh, code reviewer doesn't really have to look at. Uh, the, uh, because the template's strict, there's no more no escape. Instead, what we did is uh, change the, the um, declaration of this profile structure such that this field about HTML is now of type safe HTML instead of type plain string. And the template system recognizes those types and will then suppress the automatically inferred escaping. Uh, so this, this behaves as intended from a functional perspective. This field sort of traces through the whole system as that type. So this structure basically makes its way with this field of that type across all these RPT, RPC mechanisms. Uh, and we have implementations of these types uh, in all the languages. And uh, we have RPC mechanisms that have a way of serializing those types. And then somewhere down here in the back end, uh, we're now in the situation where the code reads the uh, value of these fields from the profile storage. It comes up as a plain string, but we actually what we need uh, to, to set this profile uh, field, this about field, about HTML field in the profile uh, structure is of type safe HTML. So we have a type mismatch. If we just try to compile it, uh, we get a compile error. So we need to basically take this plain string about which we cannot make any assumptions uh, and, and turn it into safe HTML. And what we do for that is we call out to a library that sanitizes HTML markup. What it really does is just uh, parse the HTML markup and um, essentially reduce it down to an inert safe subset of HTML that will not cause any script execution. And then it gives you back the result of doing that uh, as, uh, as a safe <coughs> HTML. And it uses one of those unchecked conversions to do that. Now, if this goes back to our, uh, our code auditor, the only thing she really has to look at now is, is the fan-in of this unchecked conversion, because that's really the only security-sensitive code. None of the stuff up there is, assuming we kind of trust our type system reasonably, uh, is, is relevant, right? We don't have to read the templates because they're always safe, and we don't have to read the code that transports these values in the form of that type around the system. So the really only security-relevant code is the fan-in to those places where we actually make instances of this type. And incidentally, this is actually a shared library, so it's already been reviewed. And the first review is straightforward because uh, we can apply local reasoning within that module. It's an HTML sanitizer that anyway is security sensitive. And in fact, it's code that's been around for 10 years from the early days of Gmail. So we've already uh, reviewed it probably five times, and we have high, high confidence in it. And what we're really doing is just take the output of that and turn it into a safe HTML. And we, we basically know that the output of the sanitizer always satisfies the type contract. So this is like a very easy thing to reason about, right? In particular, we don't have to look at any of the application code. It's really local to that module. So if you look at how this turned out in practice, uh, we basically implemented these uh, strict contextual escaping modes in closure templates and, and other widely used template systems at Google. And then we had uh, a couple of flagship applications adopt this approach. In particular, Gmail and Google Plus were some of the early adopters. And we've indeed seen a very trust drastic reduction in bugs. Um, in particular, um, Google Plus had something like 30 XSS vulnerabilities in the bug tracker in the year 2011. This is maybe a little bit high for that size of application. They were under very rapid development at the time. But still, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a no matter what, a sizable number of bugs. And then once they adopted this approach and refactored all their code to use strict templates and get rid of all the inner HTML assignments and so on, they really have had no application level XSS since September 2013. So this, uh, this is really a, a, a very nice result. There's a little star there, so there's a little bit fine print that, I've, that I'll get to in a, in a second. Um, and there, there's a bit more to it, so if you want to read up on this, there is there's an article in Communications of the ACM um, in last September, I think. Um, so onto the fine print, right? There is, there is some fine print, there are some limitations. Um, one I've kind of already touched on is we essentially rely on the type system to uphold the integrity of those types as they float around the system. And in the real world languages that we use, type systems are not exactly watertight, right? So we have reflection in Java, we have casts, we have sort of convention-based visibility enforcement in dynamic languages. And so in principle, it's possible for a programmer to write code that uses reflection, that pokes into, in, into the implementation of the safe HTML type and just assigns whatever they want to it and violate the type contract. And so we could have bugs that way. Um, but, you know, we kind of assume our developers are reasonable, in particular, again, I guess in our threat model, uh, 
uh, we actually assume that the developer is not malicious, they're just human and prone to making mistakes, right? So we're not trying to catch actually evil people. There's other mechanisms uh, for that. Um, the other thing that is sort of a, a big factor there, I think, is the idiomatic use in the language. It's basically a complete no-no uh, in, in our environment, at least, to use reflection in application-level Java code. You would never get this past a code review because it's just a thing you don't do. Uh, it belongs you know, deep down into the guts of a web app framework or something like that. In other languages, like in Ruby, for instance, I think it's more sort of par for the course to use mixins to crack open a type and then add behavior to it. And so in that case, it might be more difficult to reason about the integrity of the, the type. Uh, but in, you know, in, in Java, I'm not really too worried about this type of uh, thing happening. Um, more fundamentally, there are no formal guarantees. There are no formal underpinnings for this approach. In particular, the safe HTML types uh, have no formal specification for the type contract. The type contract is sort of verbally spe specified, and it's kind of self-referential, right? It basically, the definition of XSS, uh, of, of the safe HTML type is that uh, it's a string that will not cause XSS when rendered as HTML. And this is, uh, so I come sort of from way back from a formal background, from a formal methods background, so this kind of rankles me a little bit, um, and it would be nice to have a, a, formal, a more formal approach to defining these types, which would then allow us to make more rigorous arguments that, for instance, our sanitizers and our template systems actually uphold the type contract. In practice, I'm not yet too much worried about it, uh, because, I mean, so right now the problem is essentially that the, the, these properties, adherence to the type contract, is established entirely on sort of, you know, ad hoc human reasoning, if you will. Uh, but the one thing that is important to note is that the, the reasoning is, is local, it's, it's module local, right? It's uh, just reasoning about the template system in isolation, it's reasoning about the sanitizer in isolation, we don't have to do this reasoning about the entire program, which is what really makes this uh, in the sort of pre-state intractable. And then the other observation is that in practice, really the bugs are not there, right? The bugs are in application code, people use the wrong escaping, they forget to use escaping, and that's where the bugs come from bugs in these, um, in, in what is now sort of the, um, uh, I guess the trusted core of this, this, uh, this framework uh, are really, really rare, right? I mean, uh, I don't know when the last bug in our sanitizer was discovered, for instance. So in practice, I'm not too worried about it, but in, in principle, it does, it does worry me a little bit. And maybe there's something we can talk about after. I'm kind of curious to see what the sort of um, more academic crowd here thinks about this, this aspect. Um, then there's also some, uh, I guess, pathological uses. So uh, in the SQL case, for instance, uh, the builder basically makes a guarantee that the resulting query has no data flow dependency on untrusted input, but we do allow control flow dependency, which is something we have to allow for practical reasons. Now it turns out that, of course, a control flow dependency uh, essentially implies an effective data flow dependency, right? Like somebody could write code that just iterates character by character over the input and then produces a concatenation of trusted strings that's exactly equal to the input. And then they basically turn the untrusted input into nominally trusted, um, uh, a nominally trusted value. Uh, again, this is something that I'm not too worried about because this would sort of border on the malicious if somebody did this. And uh, we'd probably you know, find them and have a stern talking uh, to with them, right? I mean, this, so I, in, in practice, I, I hope this wouldn't happen. But you know, we'll see. We'll deal with it when it happens. It hasn't yet. Um, but again, you know, this is kind of a limitation of the formal guarantees that we can make uh, with these approaches. All right, so let me just uh, sort of summarize and talk a little bit about uh, some of the, I guess, uh, sort of key insights and lessons that we learned as we did this, and uh, some of the aspects of this approach that I think were crucial to making it work. Um, the first observation is that it's actually okay to change code. Um, so if I look at the related work in the literature, there does seem to be a lot of work where there's an implicit assumption that you just have to take the program as it is, and even if it's like horrible PHP spaghetti code, you need to somehow make that work and, and give guarantees in that, in that uh, model, right? And so then you end up with very complicated approaches using you know, dynamic taint flow analysis or dy dynamic taint tracking and, and uh, static analysis and so on. In this case, we basically get, we're okay actually to change a little bit how programmers write code, and we're okay to do the global refactoring to adjust our code base to the new API once, if it's reasonable. Uh, we're changing a little bit, not too much, right? So for instance, in the, in the SQL case, we're really still allowing the programmer to do string concatenation. We're just uh, requiring them to express it a little bit differently from what they did before. They basically have to use dot append instead of plus equals, but otherwise it's really still the same thing. 
Um, but just making that little change allowed us to get the guarantee that we want, and in particular, allowed us to have a very, very simple implementation of that guarantee. I mean, the, the core of that is really almost uh, embarrassingly simple, right? It's, it's like what I showed on that slide and the, and the checker is like together maybe 60 lines of actual code plus boilerplate, right? And that's, that's, that's the total implementation. So we end up with a very, very simple approach that gives us the guarantee, and in return, we have to do some upfront work uh, to um, adjust existing code to that uh, approach, and we have to ask developers to just change their ways a little bit, but not too much. And so I think that's a really valuable uh, thing to keep in mind uh, with, these, with these types of um, uh, approaches. So I think the, the kind of fundamental, um, uh, I guess, insight, I want to say, uh, in, in this whole approach is that we, uh, we essentially require from our uh, APIs Im implementations to not make any assumptions about values of basic data types, in particular strings, right? So if you consume a string in an API, you have to assume that it might be potentially attacker controlled. You're not allowed to assume anything about it, which in practice means you have to do whatever the appropriate runtime validation or escaping is within the implementation of your API. Now this might seem like it actually creates a lot of extra work and duplication, but it really doesn't, right? Because uh, the escaping, for instance, has to happen somewhere along this long data flow. Uh, and so it might as well just happen in the place where it actually matters. And so we've basically uh, essentially hoisted all the escaping operations into the implementation of the API, and we've relieved all the rest of the code from even worrying about it, right? Um, so I think that's a, that's a really crucial um, uh, concept, I think. Now, there are cases where the API just has, for semantic reasons, to make assumptions about uh, some of its inputs. So for instance, if we're trying to render uh, some blob of HTML that we have to assume is safe, we basically can't escape it, because otherwise it wouldn't do what we want to do. And in those cases, again, sticking to the rule that we can't make assumptions about plain string, valued, um, uh, plain string type values, uh, we then structure our API so that the client is required to essentially prove to us that the value is actually safe to use. And our preferred way of doing that is to use types. Uh, we just use language native types to uh, annotate these values effectively. We could have used type annotation. So for instance, the um, UDAP uh, checker framework might have worked quite nicely. We chose types for practical reasons because it's simpler and all the IDEs knows about the, know about them and uh, it was less code to you know, worry about and maintain. Uh, but there might be applications where using annotations is preferred to using native types. I think it's a relatively small distinction. And then there are cases where uh, we can't actually express an API constraint, a, a constraint on correct use of an API using the type system, using type sign signatures. And so in, in that case, in those cases, we resort to typically very simple uh, static checks. Uh, keeping those checks simple, I think, is extremely valuable. Uh, and, and lightweight because it allows us to actually run them in the context of the existing toolchain, so they can run on every compile because they're really cheap. Uh, we don't run them after the fact in like a you know later on uh, unit testing cycle or whatever. They just run right when the code gets compiled. And so if we um, if we find a violation of one of these checks, we can basically make it a hard compiler error, and the code never even gets checked in because it never even compiles. And so I think that's that's really valuable. Another way to look at this is, um, so uh, injection bugs are fundamentally a, a tainted data flow problem, right? Uh, there's untrusted input that's tainted, that somehow flows through the system, gets combined with other values, and then makes it to a sink that uh, interprets in a way that's subject to injection. And so I think there's a natural inclination to actually use taint tracking approaches to, um, to attack this problem. And I think, uh, sort of from what I've learned in doing this, uh, this actually doesn't work that well. And, the intuition behind that is that if you, if, you, if you look at a typical transactional application, what it does is manipulate user data, right? If it didn't, it wouldn't probably be doing anything very interesting. And uh, so what that means is that actually most of the variables that the program manipulates are tainted, right? They're all tainted. Everything is tainted. And so now you have all these values that you're, you have to keep track of their taintedness or their untaintedness after they've been sanitized. And on top of that, you have these really complicated long data flows. So applying taint tracking, both static and dynamic, to this problem is actually really, really hard. Right? And so what we've done instead is essentially turn the problem upside down. We've just said everything by default is assumed to be tainted, and the implementation of the API has to deal with that. 
by either runtime escaping, or if it can't, in those relatively rare cases, then it has to use something that tracks the safety, so to speak. And in this case, we just use types. So we use types to annotate values that are known to be safe. And then we also get the benefit that the type system basically does the whole program reasoning for us, and it's very good at that. I mean, that's, you know, uh, so basically the type checker is sort of my favorite static anal analyzer, right? It's always there and it works and it's great. Um, yeah, so this is really, I think, uh, another good way to put this is like you, you, you worry about the safety and you assume everything else is, 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 um, is tainted. Um, one important thing is this actually, again, works in practice because most of the values are tainted and it's very, very uncommon uh, to have the need to annotate values are safe. So the, the use of this safe HTML type is really relatively rare um, just because in practice most strings that a program manipulates are really just plain text, right? It's somebody's name or it's, a, it's just plain text, right? There's no, no markup in there typically. It's very uncommon. And so this is why, what makes this practical. Otherwise, we'd have to have, we'd have too much work where we have to basically use those types to annotate, uh, to annotate safety. But in, in practice, it happens rarely, so it's, it's not an issue. Um, so the other thing we did is we basically tried to design APIs that are really simple and relatively similar to what the programmer is used to be doing. Um, and we made them safe. But the simplicity uh, is, is, is pretty essential, I think. Um, and we've try to do it in a way such that the very vast majority of use cases in real programs can be satisfied by this safe API. And this turned out to be the case. I mean, this is not obvious, but in hindsight, it, it actually worked. And I think it's crucial to make it work um, because um, to satisfy the sort of unusual use cases, we have this potentially unsafe API uh, and all the uses of that, we have to manually review, right? And so this is only practical if it's rarely needed. Uh, and then as it turns out, it is, so uh, it, it takes a, a very small team of people to kind of curate the use of this API and make sure that all its uses are actually reviewed. Uh, incidentally, so this is one aspect. I've been thinking about you know, whether or not this approach might transfer outside of an organization like Google into, say, the open source world. And this is the one area where I'm not sure how to do that because it essentially relies on uh, having somebody in charge of curating the use of these potentially unsafe APIs. If you just open these up, in my experience, they end up being overused, and then you're basically back to square one. We actually have some experience with this. In earlier work we did on Google Web Toolkit, we basically had one of these unchecked conversions from string to this Google Web Toolkit equivalent of the safe HTML type, um, and we didn't have any kind of restrictions on its use. And over the years, we ended up with like something like a thousand call sites for it, um, most of which were completely unnecessary, and uh, some of it actually introduced bugs, right? So uh, basically this didn't really help, and we had to go back and do some refactoring to essentially lock down the use of this. So this, this approach really only works if somebody who knows about security, either a security team or a security-minded um, engineer on a project team, keeps a lid on the, uh, the use of these, these APIs. Um, the other thing that was, I think, really valuable for us was to be able to build on existing tooling. So uh, these things I mentioned, error-prone, uh, JavaScript conformance for controlling call sites in, in JavaScript code, and the build visibility mechanism in the build system, those were all there and they were built by our language and platforms team in support of general uh, code quality um, desires, essentially, right? And so we were just able to tag along with these and, uh, and effectively configure them for our purposes, which helped because we, it avoided our need to write a whole bunch of extra code for this kind of tooling. And I think it also helps a little bit with adoption because developers are used to these tools, they're used to getting compilation errors from them. And uh, so if they just get another compilation error uh, that happens to be security related, they already know what to do with it, right? It's, it's a compiler error, programmers know how to deal with it. It's not some security specific tool that comes in after the fact and complains to them about something security related and then they're like, what are these security people giving us a hassle about, right? So I think this, this um, probably has a lot to do with making this work in practice. So just to recap the benefits, I think the, the most important thing is, as I, as, I, as I said before, is that potentially vulnerable code just never even compiles, it never gets checked in. Um, and so we, we end up uh, in a state where um, there's no potential vulnerability. It, it uh, really would be, uh, to have a potential vulnerability implies a misuse of the API that we can at compile time prohibit. Um, so this is very different from the current state where there's lots of code that is potentially vulnerable, like this long data flow of this about HTML uh, 
field that I, that I showed you in the, in the uh, original state of that slice of the program. And uh, now I have to reason about it. I might get warnings from a, a static analysis system. And I have to debate with a programmer to pretty please refactor this so it's a little bit more obviously correct. But then they'll go like, well, I don't really have time. And unless you show me an actual bug, I won't do it. Um, whereas in this model, we've essentially turned it around that they just cannot write the code that has even potential bugs. Right? So I think that's really, uh, really valuable. And of course, I mean, this, this sounds very drastic, but again, we've done this in a way where uh, we really don't make their lives significantly harder, right? I mean, they still get to use the same template system, and very arguably, we've made their lives easier because they never have to worry about escaping. And the only time they have to do something special is if they, if they want the template system to not apply the default escaping, and then they have to use those types. But that's, that's pretty reasonable because it happens very infrequently. Um, so the, I guess the essential property of this whole approach is that it, it confines the potential for bugs into a very small part of the code base. Uh, if there's an XSS in an application that uses the approach, it basically has to be within the template system or within the sanitizer or within the implementation of those types. It, it can't be in application code, right? And so this is really powerful, right? Because it, uh, of course, drastically reduces the potential for bugs because now the whole application code is basically no longer, um, no longer contributes to the uh, potential for bugs and then also results in uh, drastic reduction in the actual bugs that we observe. If we have far fewer potential bugs, we obviously have fewer actual bugs. And our sort of anecdotal stats, I guess, from the projects we've applied this to in sort of before and after state actually bear this out. Um, the, the flip side of that is also that the review burden for a security engineer who needs to make an assessment of this application is drastically reduced because they don't really have to read most of the application code anymore. They only have to read the uh, easily identified security sensitive pieces of code which are the fan into these unchecked conversions. And in most cases, they might actually be in common libraries and have already been reviewed in the past. So. It, it reduces their work, and it makes it actually practical for them to read uh, all the code that is security, security relevant, right? In the current state, we're basically talking about hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and it's really not practical to analyze that in depth and, and really reason about it, whereas now we're in a state where the code you need to look at is, is really relatively small and, um, and easily identified. And so with that, we also get uh, significantly increased confidence in the correctness. As I said, there's no formal guarantees, but uh, as a security auditor, as a code auditor, you can make a much stronger statement about code that's organized like this as opposed to code that is you know, in the ad hoc way as it was before. And so just to summarize, I mean, uh, I think the important takeaway is that this is, it's, it's all about API design, right? There's no fancy static analysis or chain tracking or anything like this. We've basically just gone ahead and taken uh, security as an emergent property of the design of the application and applied that as a primary driver to the design of these APIs. Um, API design, of course, is a big topic. And uh, I think there is, in, in most cases, so the desire is to make the API, um, design an API such that it reduces the possibility for bugs, right? So there's you know, the principle of least surprise, for instance. We don't want an API that has a method that sounds like from its name that it'll be very quick and uh, it'll do a very, a, a very small amount of work and then that thing all of a sudden actually in the implementation spins up threads and makes RPCs and might block for a long time. Uh, that's a surprise to the programmer which in this case results in a performance issue, right? And so in, here we basically have the same thing. We have APIs that uh, surprise the programmer by um, allowing the introduction of security bugs and uh, now, security bugs are in many ways different from regular bugs. They're in many ways more, more bad, right? Because we, for instance, can't not choose to fix them. They're more urgent to fix. They're more expensive in general. They're more damaging very often. And so uh, in this case, we've actually been able to sort of elevate this principle of least surprise and make it a principle of no surprise, right? We've actually made the API, we've changed the API into a state where you really cannot write code anymore that has the undesired class of bugs. And so that's uh, all I have to say. Thanks for listening. And I, I don't know how much time. Well, I'm actually pretty good on time. So any questions? So, so you seem to have, have taken the approach of let's look at where the problems are happening and deal with those. So what's the next problem to deal with? Uh, that's a good question. So um, it, it'll be. 
Uh, so as I said in the beginning, it's actually not obvious that this approach applies to a given class of bugs. In these two cases, it turned out it was the case. There are some other areas that we're looking at. Uh, for instance, crypto APIs come to mind. Uh, there's a lot of crypto bugs because that arise from a, a crypto API giving a programmer that doesn't really know crypto too much choice, right? It allows them to, cha to choose cipher modes or uh, it makes the client of the API responsible for supplying nonces that sh should, be should be unique or initialization vectors. And so people mess this up. And so uh, one thing we're looking at is creating APIs that basically take that choice away from the programmer and sort of work at a higher level. So you, instead of getting like AES and an HMAC as an API, you get an API that, uh, to which you give a string and in return you get a, an authenticated and uh, encrypted blob. And that's all it does, right? And it doesn't give you any choices. So that's, that's sort of another area we've worked on that we're thinking about. Uh, there's, there's some other areas that are more tenuous. Um, one area I've been thinking about is authorization. Are there ways to structure code so that it becomes easier to reason about the uh, domain-specific authorization code uh, that's part of the code base? Uh, so not things that could be provided by like a lower storage layer, but rather domain-specific code in the application that has to do with authorization. And typically, if you don't do anything about this, this kind of code tends to be spread out all over the code base. And then it becomes very difficult for a, a code auditor to reason about the emergent property from all of the combination of these pieces of code that are all over the app, right? And so I've been thinking about whether or not we can come up with ways to help programmers structure their program in a way that this, all this security relevant code ends up uh, in like one place or in some way is more um, discoverable by an auditor and more easy to reason about. So th those would be two examples. There's probably more, but. Um. So would this work with frameworks? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we actually have this integrated in uh, some of the frameworks we use internally. So we don't use open source frameworks for the most part. We have internally developed frameworks that are you know, pretty similar though to the stuff you find in the open source world. And uh, for instance, we have integrated uh, the rendering of strict templates with those, uh, with those frameworks, right? So your default way of uh, rendering a server-side response uh, is through one of the strict templates rather than writing a string to, a, to an output, uh, to like a servlet string writer or something like that. So uh, on the, on the server-side, this does integrate. Well, not necessarily. I mean, you, uh, I guess you, the work you would have to do to uh, uh, use this in a, uh, in a, uh, uh, a web application that's built on a different framework is to essentially identify the server-side uh, injectable syncs, which is basically the server-side rendering of content of HTTP responses, and then constrain those to use instead safe wrappers such as the rendering of uh, one of those templates. And that's you know, relatively straightforward to do. Again, it's, it's simple to write these constraints in, in something like error prone. I mean, you can use, you know, uh, we, use these, we use these mechanisms like error prone and JavaScript um, compiler conformance framework uh, because they, they kind of are more scalable. But in a smaller project, you could probably do almost all of that with like just a regular expression-based pre-submit hook in your, in your uh, code repository or something like this, right? I mean, if you just ban inner HTML as a string to occur in your JavaScript code, you're basically 95% there. So it's, it's, it doesn't have to be complicated. Uh, yeah, I guess actually I should repeat the questions, I think. So the question is, did we measure the uh, usability of the new APIs? We didn't uh, directly measure it. We have some anecdotal evidence in terms of sort of a lack of developer complaints, right? I mean, so uh, we basically deployed this. We just went, I mean, so for instance, the, uh, the, uh, the SQL API, we really just went through all the code in Google, and we didn't even talk to all the people who use it. Uh, we just send out CLs to, or we had a robot send out CLs to change their code. And this is kind of a pretty common thing. So people are used to it. They just accept them if their tests still pass. And, uh, and then it just changed, right? And so uh, after that, we haven't really gotten a lot of complaints. So it seems to be working, right? I mean, um, it's, it's it'd probably be, I mean, I guess we could do some studies, but you know, 
unless we get any complaints, it's probably not worth doing it. And you know, the engineers are pretty vocal people, so if they don't like it, they will tell you, right? So it's uh, it, the the sort of silence in terms of complaints has probably been a pretty good indication that it's reasonably usable. So the, the question is, uh, are there ways to make it easier uh, to apply these approaches uh, uh, with respect to the design of the underlying languages like JavaScript and HTML? Um, so I think with respect to programming languages, having static types really helps uh, because it, it makes it much easier to enforce these kinds of constraints with precision. So as it turns out, within Google, JavaScript is actually a statically typed language, right? It's basically required that people use Clojure Compiler and use type annotations on the JavaScript. Uh, and so we, we get to leverage this. It's not a requirement. You can, you can do all these things with runtime types. Uh, it's basically for people who like to live dangerously and only find out that they made a mistake when they run their application. Sure, I mean, if you want to live that way, um, it's fine, right? But uh, you, you would essentially get the same guarantees. It's, it's easier to do this with precision if the language is typed. I think HTML and the whole web platform is, is uh, kind of a bit of a different beast. I think, um, I mean, the web platform is just fundamentally full of sharp edges. And uh, it's sort of a conglomerate of things that have been stacked on top of each other. And uh, it sort of does seem there hasn't been not a whole lot of coherent thought about sort of the uh, security properties. I mean, you basically, I don't know if you've probably read uh, my colleague Michael Zalewski's book, The Tangled Web. And it's, you know, it's good bedtime reading. it make you cry. You'll cry yourself to sleep uh, if, every time you read a chapter. It's, it's really horrible, right? I mean, and so, so uh, uh, I, you know, I mean, just for, for, for instance, one thing that comes to mind is, is things like just having JavaScript in line with the document, in hindsight, is a really bad idea. And essentially, CSP sort of retrofits what should have happened in the, begin, in, in the first place is that the script is supplied out of band, uh, specified by, by an HTTP response header or something like this. Uh, and then a lot of these issues wouldn't even be possible, right? Uh, similar things like JavaScript. Uh, schemed URLs seem like a really bad idea in hindsight, right? I mean, they probably had their purpose at some point in the development of, or in the evolution of the web. Um, so I think, um, I guess in, in more general terms, uh, what it comes down to is that basically you have APIs that uh, fundamentally are, through their design, subject to injection because they mix uh, data and, and uh, behavior. And that just seems like always a, a a bad idea that should be avoided. I mean, it's, you know, there's good reasons for it. I mean, SQL is very convenient, uh, but it, it does cause a lot of headaches, right? And so uh, I think one's instinct, I guess, in API design in the future maybe should be to avoid that altogether if possible and to avoid things like stringly typed values, right? Always use an enum instead of a string and uh, those types of things. But it's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. I mean, there are a lot of constraints, so I don't think I have really any more useful answers on that. Um, that's a good question. So the, the question is about uh, a data consistency. And I think, uh, so, uh, and, and how, how this approach sort of interacts with that. Um, so th this is actually a very good question. I mean, so um, one thing I, uh, what we're basically doing here is, is, is uh, uh, to step back. I mean, one of the sort of key tenets that we are teaching in security is to always validate your inputs, right? Validate your external inputs. Uh, it turns out that, uh, with respect to validation, uh, with respect to specific contexts such as injection, I'm actually of the opinion that that's bad advice, right? It's much more uh, uh, 
practical to just do the validation by this near the sink, right? Because then you know you're validating for that context as opposed to validating ahead of time where your data might be used in all kinds of different contexts. Now this is validation with respect to uh, specific uh, classes of security vulnerabilities such as a specific kind of injection. Uh, there's, of course, higher level issues uh, that relate to data consistency and, uh, for instance, um, Basically, I mean, it's, it's less about injection. It's more about confusing the control flow in your application due to inconsistent data. And that kind of validation is extremely important and valuable. And so, um, but I think it's largely orth orthogonal to these concerns, right? So if you, if you for instance, um, I mean, one example might be that when you're, uh, when you're consuming an external input that's supposed to be an email address, maybe it's actually uh, a better idea rather than passing this thing around as a plain string to actually pass it into a domain object that represents an email address that then has itself a time contract that's a, a, a well-formed email address or a well-formed URL or a well-formed whatever, right? And then uh, use that type uh, throughout your program because then that type can actually give you meaningful uh, contracts and meaningful guarantees, right? And so that way you also avoid sort of the um, repetition of, of validation, right? Because you, you end up with a type value rather than a string that you have to re-sanitize or re-validate uh, in every context where you might be acting on it. Yeah, about uh, Liam Simpson, about uh, three sections ago, you said, no, we haven't made this available on open source, but if you're trying to influence the way that APIs are designed, or even the future of the language, get rid of some of the parts of the API that are bad, by having open source examples that everyone goes to, Oh, so so um, so the question is about open sourcing this. So so uh, I didn't actually say I don't want to open source this. In fact, the closure compiler strict mode is actually open source already. Uh, it, it's it's part of a closure compiler distribution. Uh, there are some other things that we're currently working on open sourcing. It hasn't been a priority because it's work, right? I mean, we're all, we're all busy. Uh, but I'm I'm not at all opposed to open sourcing this. My my comment about open source was more about how this actually can be effectively applied because it does seem in order to actually work, there has to be somebody on the project who plays the curator and the enforcer that it actually gets applied correctly, right? Uh, and so unless you have project teams that actually have a security person, a security auditor that you know, sets up the pre-submit scripts to actually limit the use of uh, these unchecked conversions and these sort of potentially unsafe APIs, um, you tend to probably end up with too many uses of them and then you lose the whole benefit of this approach, right? And so uh, I think to some extent that's maybe an education thing. Maybe some of the you know, bigger open source projects could actually be convinced that this is a good idea. I mean, we were able to convince large teams within Google that it's a good idea and they in fact put up their own headcount to do all the refactoring, right? So they, they, they clearly see the value and so it's not inconceivable that uh, open source projects would similarly see the value, but it would require some basically change in mindset and some, some education, perhaps. Oh, that, that column names? Okay, so the... Yeah, so, so uh, that's a good question. So, um, so the question was like in, in SQL, in the SQL API, how do we handle non-bindable values such as uh, uh, table names? There's a couple of different patterns that you can use. Uh, we actually have in some of these builders, we've added uh, additional features that allow you to essentially introspect the schema and then allow you to append uh, a table name that's actually part of the schema, right? So, um, of course, you could. This is essentially syntactic sugar, right? I mean, you could write this code your own and then basically emit a uh, a, a, a table that's or a, a dictionary that's a, a, a mapping from strings to uh, little SQL builder snippets that are of that value, and then you basically end up turning these table names into constants, and you can you can do the do it that way. So. I don't think um, this is a fundamental constraint. And then also, I mean, there are certain things. So for instance, in our languages, um, uh, in our SQL dialects, uh, you can bind uh, list valued variables and it'll automatically sort of do the expansion. Whereas in MySQL, for instance, you'd have to expand this into like a, you know, question marks and, and uh, uh, like into a vector basically of the exact same length. 
Uh, that's again something you could add to a corresponding builder that works for SQL, uh, but I don't think it's a it's a fundamental limitation. And again, in the worst case, you know, if, if there is some really unusual case that you can't express, you have this backdoor API, and you can actually use this to uh, just create a snippet that just um, a, a, a basically a builder, a custom builder for just that particular snippet of a query that you need, and then uh, only that little piece of it becomes something that needs to be manually reviewed, and the rest of it is still it gets the, the safety of the, uh, of the overall API. There's another question in here. Oh, yeah, good. Uh, from the, um, uh, my question is that how do you track the safety of the new uh, Is there any possibility that the one you can try to link other existing parts? Uh, so the question is, how do I decide that the new API is safe? Um, so that's, that kind of goes back to my comment that I don't actually have a, a formal underpinning for this approach, right? So in, I think in this SQL case, I'm really not too worried about it because, I mean, I'm still using string concatenation, so I, it's hard to see how I could have made things worse. Uh, in, the, uh, in the template case, um, it's less obvious, um, and it would be nice, as I said, to apply some more formal reasoning and formally specify the type contract, for instance, for these safe HTML types, and then try to actually make a rigorous argument that a sanitizer produces always values that are compliant with that type contract. Uh, in practice, I'm not quite sure about how to, go, how to go about this, in particular considering that there isn't really a good formal spec of the web platform. There's, of course, some work that has attempted to do this, but I think in practice, a lot of the bugs actually arise from code that doesn't, that's totally outside of the spec. I mean, we have code in there that, for instance, deals with, uh, you know, I mean, there's like the fact that you can uh, use the expression a syntax in uh, CSS uh, in IE in quirks mode still, right? So that, I mean, normally CSS doesn't result in script execution, but in older IEs in quirks mode it does. Or we have things that deal with the fact that uh, any document that has a PDF header in the first uh, 1K of the document can actually be read by the PDF plugin as a PDF document. And then if we don't worry about, uh, if we don't correctly escape this, uh, then, then we have problems. So we actually have code in our JSON encoders that deals with the fact that a document could be interpreted by the PDF document and misinterpreted as such, right? And so there's a lot of these things that are just really weird stuff that, um, that uh, really would seem very, very difficult to capture in a, in a formal specification. And it's probably these edge cases actually where the bugs come from. And really in the end what it comes down to is we write this code and then we give it to people like Michael Zalewski and Eduardo Vela and say, what do you think about this? And like, well, you forgot to deal with this weird quirk in IE and otherwise it looks good, right? I mean, so in the end, uh, this is really an empiric science in a way to, um, uh, to figure out what you need to do to avoid script injections across all the available browsers, sadly. Maybe it'll get better. I mean, once everybody sticks to HTML5, maybe this is something that, that might be more profitable. But for now, I think just doing that is a limitation. I mean, you could do some formal reasoning, but I think the spec itself would be based on uh, empirical work about the actual behavior of real browsers. And uh, a lot of that would be based on like reverse engineering or something, which is not a good way to write a spec, right? So uh, I'm, I'm not too sure if it's worth spending a lot of time on that at this time. Um, so I don't think they support procedures. Uh, one thing they do is they support protocol buffers. To be honest, I'm not actually uh, an expert on these databases. Um, uh, so I think, um, I mean, there's, there's papers published about it. I had some reference in there, and if you will, I can, if you want, I can, I can give you the, the pointer to it. Uh, Ah, okay, yeah, 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 that's a good point. So if you have, if you have at the database level code that basically uh, you, has a, a stored procedure in the database that itself is subject to SQL injection, uh, then uh, that's sort of another layer of this problem. And the builder at the level of the client language couldn't prevent that, obviously, right? So I think in that case, what you would have to do, I guess, is maybe implement a, simple, a similar builder in, as a SQL procedure and then uh, use some kind of lint or static check or whatever to enforce that all the uh, stored procedure code uh, 
uses that builder instead of string concatenation to make further queries, right? Um, I mean, I, otherwise, yeah, I don't, I, I can't. You haven't done that. No, I haven't. Yeah, I, we, we don't, we don't have that uh, problem. 